Good morning, everybody. It's great to be worshiping with you all on this uh, early September morning. And uh, as we move from summer into fall and as the weather changes, it's, it's great to, uh, to experience that, but also great to, to get to be together. And uh, I want to welcome those of you who are worshiping with us here um, in the sanctuary, but also those of you who are worshiping with us at home. I'm going to start with a, a brief reading from Psalm 84. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord Almighty! My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may have her young, a place near your altar. O Lord Almighty, my King and my God, blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, who have set their hearts on pilgrimage. Um, And this is a passage where where we're going to be we're going to be singing some of the words from this passage. It's a passage that we've, we've probably heard before and read before. And this morning, this, th- this last line really, really caught my attention. Blessed are those whose strength is in you who have set their hearts on pilgrimage. This idea that as we kind of move through this world, we're on a pilgrimage, right? We're on a journey to experience who God is. We're on a journey to, to know more about God, to, to deepen our, our, our love of God, to deepen our communion with God. Um, Augustine says that our hearts are restless until we rest in you, God. And so there's this sense that, that as we seek God, as we search for, for God, our hearts are always going to be restless. We're going to be yearning. We're going to be longing to encounter God where, wherever he might be, wherever he might reveal himself to us. And I'm thankful for times like this when we can come together, uh, when we can, can, can be together, we can join uh, our hearts together in pilgrimage as we seek God together. Um, and I'm even more thankful that, that God reminds us throughout Scripture that when we seek God, He will be found. When we seek God, He will make Himself known to us. And so that's what happens when we, when we gather here for worship. We seek God together. We lift up our voices um, as, we, as we call upon Him together. And, and God makes Himself known to us. God is, God is here with us. God is present with us when we gather in this way. So as we worship today, let's turn our hearts on that pilgrimage toward God. Let's uh, direct our, our, our thoughts and our attentions to uh, the one uh, who, um, who, has, who has loved us and who has redeemed us, and let's seek his dwelling place together and, and seek him together. Let's worship. Good morning. If you'll stand, if you're able, you can join us as we begin our time of worship.
One thing I ask and I would seek to see your beauty, to find you in the place your glory dwells. Better is one cried out for you the living God your spirit's water from my soul I've tasted and I've seen come once again to me I will draw near to you I will draw near to you better is one Better is one day in your house, better is one day in your courts than thousands elsewhere. Better is one day in your courts, better is one day in your house, better is one day in your courts than thousands elsewhere, and thousands elsewhere.
A reading from the Gospel of Luke. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. You may be seated. Let's pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for being our constant and unchanging source of light and life. Yet we also give you thanks and praise for being a God that understands and even gives us seasons of change. 
whether this time of year means for us the start of school, the start of football, the start of action theater, or even just the first hints of fall itself, we know that you are close and near in the changes of this life. The word that theologians use for this is eminence, but we know that this is felt and experienced far more, far more profoundly than it is ever spoken about. So Lord, we ask you to open our eyes and make us undoubtedly aware of who you are, what you're doing, and how we might bear witness to those things in our lives and in our communities. Give us the strength, the wisdom, and the willingness to do and be what you would have us do and be, and allow us to acknowledge the humans around us who will continue to spur us on toward love and good deeds. Above all, we ask that we remind ourselves and each other of the gift of your Son, your word spoken to us and among us, Jesus Christ. And because we are a stubborn people, we trust that you will faithfully gather us back here again, week after week, by the power of your Holy Spirit, to once again remind us of our identity again and again. And so when the seasons change, Lord, it is in this constant collective remembering that we undertake this morning that gives us the hope to boldly proclaim your good news. And so we ask for that and all these things in your son's holy name. Amen. On the first morning following the night I was born again, I stumbled upon an old knife that my grandfather had made. It had lived long past its usefulness, with its blade broken and pitted with rust, but its handle, which he had made from the antler of a buck he had killed, was good as new. As I stood there, running my hands over the smooth white handle, I was still reeling from the night before. I didn't understand what had happened to me. I knew it was important. I knew it was the most important moment of my life. I knew something was different, that I was different from who I'd been just a day before. Yet my memory of that moment, that my memory of, of my conversion, was already starting to fade. It was like like trying to hold on to a dream. I knew I needed to remember. More than anything, I needed to remember that moment that I was saved. So I popped the pins holding the handle to the steel of the knife, and I carved a piece of the bone into a small cross. I strung it on a thin black cord and hung it around my neck. I was 13 years ago, and with the exception of the time I changed the cord and the few times Delaney wanted to wear it, it never left my neck until last Monday. That cross was very important to me. It served as a reminder of a God I didn't understand, of a savior I didn't deserve, a reminder that I'm made anew. I would often find myself holding it in prayer reaching for it in times of grief and in times of joy. It became for me a kind of amulet, a, a talisman, a constant reminder that something special had happened to me, something special had been given to me, and that no matter what had happened in my life, I had been profoundly blessed. In a moment of carelessness, I jumped into Watauga Lake on Monday, and it was gone. It took maybe... 10 or 15 minutes for me to realize it was missing. I stood in the water watching Callum and Delaney play, and I reached for my cross in a moment of joy, a moment of thanksgiving, 
of habit probably more than anything else. And I panicked. I clumsily grabbed at my neck and searched all around me, but I knew the truth. I was never going to find it. In searching for it, though, I instead saw the people around me. I saw my wife, an elder, an angel. I thought of you, my brothers and sisters. And I watched as my daughter and my godson splashed in the murky water, and I saw clearly You people are my reminder. I didn't have a church family in those hours or even years after my conversion. I didn't really understand my belonging to a body. I knew I needed a reminder, but didn't yet know the form God had intended that reminder to take. Old habits die hard. And in those panicked moments when my cross was gone... When I could no longer tug on that cord and dig it into my skin and remind myself of who I was and who had saved me, I grasped for something else, for anything else, and found as a matter of wise design the words we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. This do in remembrance of me. Paul remembers his Lord and offers his words to address abuses of the Lord's Supper. And continues in verse 29 saying, For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. Discerning the body of Christ. Paul doesn't just mean the body lowered from the cross, nor of the believer reading his words. But most especially the body gathered at this place and at this time for this holy meal. Friends, reach not for the cross, for the cross is empty. Its work is finished. Reach not for the grave, for he's not there. He has risen, just as he said. Remember them, but in remembrance, reach instead for the body they once held. Yes, cleave to the body of Christ broken upon that cross, but cleave moreover to the body made whole in his resurrection. Reach not for your belongings, but for your belonging to the body. Grab onto the people around you, those saints who with you remember our shared promise of salvation. This is our reminder. This is why God calls together the local church and calls us to this weekly meal. Because we need to remember. We need to remember what Christ has done. We need to remember our, pro- our proclamation of his work in death. And we need to remember the new creation we find of ourselves in his resurrected body. Embrace the instincts of a newly reborn Christian and the practice of old. As we proclaim to each other that our reminder is here. And we remember together that I'm a sinner and so are you. But the grace abounds to the greatest of sinners. And God did not spare a modicum of grace or a moment of grief for this wretch. Yet sent his son to bring me home among you. That you and I are here and bound together around this table is the greatest treasure of our lives. Let us rejoice, friends. Let us celebrate. Let us remember our Lord who won for us that precious jewel. And so grab onto it, hold on tight, and don't let go. your heart in the stream of life. Let the pain and the sorrow be washed away in the waves of a 
mercy as deep cries out to deep we sing come Lord Jesus come come Lord Jesus God has, has been reminding us a few moments ago. We're here to uh, remember this morning. We're here to honor and remember your son. We are an imperfect people who are loved by a perfect God. You showed your love through the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus to a people who did not want that gift did not appreciate that gift, but deserved it nonetheless, or needed it nonetheless. And God, although sometimes we don't under, fully understand or fully appreciate who you are and who Jesus was, we, st we want to honor you. We want to remember Jesus. We want to remember that the creator of the universe loves us and cares for us. No matter what is going on in our lives, God, we bring, these, we bring these things to you this morning. We thank you for the gift of Jesus. We thank you for the gift of the people around us, your body. We thank you for uh, their constant reminders uh, to, uh, to each other of who you are and who we are as your people. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
on the night Jesus was betrayed, he was in his upper room with his disciples. He took the bread, he blessed it, and he broke it. He said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Likewise, after supper, Jesus, Jesus took the cup, he poured it, said, this cup is my blood of the new covenant. As often as you drink it, do so in remembrance of me. Father, all throughout scripture, you have shown us what abundance is, what your blessings can do to uh, a, a person and a people group. You've, you've shown us uh, how much you love us uh, through Jesus and your abundance of love through him. Uh, and, and God, it's at this time that we want to give something back to you. And God, uh, we don't do this as, as some form of just something we have to do, uh, something else to mark off a list that we do on a Sunday. But God, we, we bring forth gifts to you this morning out of love and thankfulness. You have, you have given us so much you provided us with so much, and not just material gifts. You've given us gifts of time, of talent, of intellect. We have food in our bellies and our roof over our head, and are free from oppression. And so God, we pray that you are honored this morning with what we bring. We give monies here in just a minute. We pray that the gifts that we bring uh, would be done so with love and will be honored. But God, we also want to commit to you this morning um, other things that we have. The time that we, the time that we have during the day um, amongst our families and our friends when we're at work or in this community. But we would always be looking to, to shine for you to be a lot to those around us, that if there are ways that we can use the, uh, our minds and our talents to, to help someone, to show someone the love of Jesus, to reflect that that's, that's in our lives to others, that we would do so, that we would be productive, and that the monies that we bring this morning, that they would be put to good use, would also be productive, not only just here, but around the world. Um, through your through your servants, it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As the kids head downstairs for Children's Church, we're going to um, 
begin something new this morning or something that we're, we're going to make a transition into a, a new time of reflection and discussion together over the next several weeks as we um, begin to look at uh, the Minor Prophets, this collection of books um, kind of at the end of the Old Testament. Um, so as we do that, let's, let's pause to pray and then we'll, um, we'll reflect on God's word together. Let's pray. God, we give you thanks for every opportunity that you give us to encounter you in your word, to encounter you in this world, um, in uh, the, the, the moments when your spirit speaks to us, the moments when um, we're surrounded by people who, who serve as, as reminders of, of who you are and, and of your love for us. Uh, God, we pray that now in this brief time we have together this morning, you would give us eyes to see you and ears to hear you as we reflect on, on the life and the work of, of, of these servants of yours, these prophets who, who lived so many years ago and yet speak to us today with the same kind of urgency and the same uh, you know, vivid um, energy that they spoke to their own people um, all those thousands of years before us. And God, we, we pray that um, as we spend some time today in reflection that you would be revealed to us and that we would embrace the, the life that you've, you've put before us. It's in your son's name we pray these things. Amen. When God entrusted Adam with the work of, of caring and, and presiding, uh, caring for and presiding over creation, and then gave him as his first major task the, the job of naming all the animals, a significant point was being made. It's a point that we're all pretty well aware of, that, that naming is a powerful act. When we name someone, when we name something, we when we, when we classify or we categorize people or things, in a very real sense, we're defining them. We're shaping the way that we and, and maybe others will look at them. This is why parents will often agonize over what name they'll give a child. But it's, it's also why families might argue or, or sort of disagree or, or debate uh, what name to give a dog or even a hamster. Names matter, right? And I, I, I say all this because today we're embarking on a series of messages reflecting on the last 12 books of the Old Testament, a collection of texts usually referred to as the Minor Prophets. And it would be a shame if we let that descriptor, that name, Minor, affect the way that, that we view these servants of God and, and the writings that bear their witness. After all, when we hear the word Minor, we often think of things as being lesser. No one ever really dreams of being a Minor League baseball player. We often criticize people or groups for majoring in the minors, meaning that they're focusing on the wrong things. So it's, it's hard to escape the sense that this exploration we're about to engage in is somehow an engagement with inferior biblical texts, as though the minor prophets had less to say to us or that their message was less important than the books that precede them, the major prophets. I probably don't need to tell you that this is simply not the case. The voices we'll encounter over the next several weeks, and, and their books are shorter than some of the other prophetic books, which is really why they have their name. But the stories they tell about who God is and, and what God is doing are not second rate. It's not as though Amos and Obadiah couldn't cut it in the big leagues, so they were resigned to the bench while the heavy hitters like Elijah and Daniel did their thing. It's just we don't know quite as much about some of these figures. We don't often spend as much time with these figures. <clears throat> the ways that God reveals himself through these 12 books that close out the Old Testament is every bit as urgent and every bit as powerful as the books that precede it. In fact, in the earliest collection of these books by the Hebrew people, the 12, as the scroll containing these books was called, was placed in the exact same category as Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel in the writings of the prophets. And the fact that these 12 books that we'll be reading uh, over the next, we'll be talking about over the next few weeks were written on a single scroll indicates that they were seen as having a unified message, that they were seen as speaking with one voice about the promises and the purposes of God. So as we look at these books, the minor prophets, over the next several weeks, we're going to be focusing less on the minor aspect and more on the prophet aspect, less on the adjective and more on the noun. Because as we've been talking about in Sunday school, and as we'll continue to talk about, the calling of a prophet was a special one. It was a powerful one. And the, it, it came to bear on the life of the ancient people of God in some significant ways that still resonate with us today, all these centuries later. So for all these reasons, and many more, I'm excited to be spending some time walking through these books together over the next couple of months. I'm 
especially excited to be starting with the book that comes first in the list of the 12, Hosea. Not because Hosea is always a fun book to read. In fact, it's, it's not in many ways. The book of Hosea is one of the most gut-wrenching and challenging texts, even in a section of scripture that's filled with gut-wrenching and challenging texts. One of the reasons I think Hosea is such a fitting place to start with our exploration of these 12 prophets is because Hosea, as much as any of these figures, embodies what a prophet does. The life of Hosea, as much as any, answers the question, who are these prophets? What do they do? What are they about? What what does a prophet's calling look like? In his book, The Prophetic Imagination, the Old Testament scholar Walter Brueggemann talks about the prophet's unique place within society, the vocation of the prophet to call his people to a sort of alternative existence, a new way of life that differs from and often runs completely counter to the dominant mode of thinking in their culture. The prophet, in other words, is to step into a world that is mired in its own concerns and pursuing its own agendas, to confront leaders, the powerful and prominent figures who believe they're calling the shots, and to speak this dual message of judgment and hope. Keep those two words in mind, judgment and hope, because these two poles, judgment and hope, give direction and give shape to the prophet's words but also to the prophet's way of life. See, with the prophet, words and actions are never very far apart from each other. It's what separates the prophets from a lot of other types of religious leaders who will say things one way and do things completely differently. Prophets don't live in that way. In fact, the the words and the actions of prophets are both meant to point, sometimes in unsettling and uncomfortable ways, to the work of God, which, as we know, is always bound up with a single purpose, a purpose that consists in both bringing judgment but also speaking hope. And both of those things are the message of one God. And so Hosea, the life that Hosea lived, the story Hosea tells, the the message that Hosea sets before the kingdom of uh, the people of the northern kingdom of Israel embodies this principle. He embodies this prophetic vocation so powerfully and so memorably. And so it's fitting to start with him. Now, despite the fact that this book of Hosea is one of the most personal accounts of any prophet, despite the fact that it reveals to readers some of the most intimate and at times difficult details of Hosea's personal life and relationships, Hosea is still a biblical character that we don't know all that much about, historically speaking. But it's interesting that if we look at what some of the the rabbis of old, the, the ancient Jewish scholars, had to say about Hosea, they took this scant mention of Hosea's father that we find in the text, and they drew a line to the tribe of Reuben. And then they told a story that God had made a promise to Reuben, the son of Jacob, when he tried to save his brother Joseph's life. Now, you might recall from the story of Joseph, the story that we read in Genesis of of Joseph and his brothers, that his brothers had had sort of taken hold of him and, and thrown him into a well. They were going to leave him for dead before they sold him into slavery. But you might recall from that story that Reuben was the brother who intended to pull Joseph out of the pit where his brothers were holding him captive when they weren't looking. And even though Reuben's plans didn't work out and Joseph ultimately got sold into slavery in Egypt, these rabbis said that God promised Reuben that because he had tried to pull his brother out of the pit, one of his descendants would attempt to pull God's people, the children of Israel, out of their pit when they needed it most. And the way these rabbis told the story, Hosea was that descendant. And that's actually a pretty fitting description of the role that Hosea plays. It's it's a fitting description of the role that a number of prophets like him occupy throughout the history of God's people. When Hosea came on the scene, Israel was stuck in a pit. It was a pit that, in so many ways, they had dug for themselves. It was the 8th century B.C., And the northern kingdom of Israel was coming to the end of a long stretch. It was a stretch of of external opposition from from enemies like Assyria and Aram, but also coupled with centuries of internal turmoil under the leadership of some pretty disastrous kings, rulers who had elevated themselves and at the same time dragged the the people down into into pursuing the, the ways of God, from pursuing the ways of God to the ways of idolatry. 
rather than pursuing and, and following the God who had redeemed the, the people from Egypt and who had brought them into the land of promise, these rulers had sought their own desires and they'd taken the people with them. They'd led the people into every type of sin and rebellion imaginable. And if you know anything about the history of Israel, you know that the end was fast approaching and that this end was not going to be a pretty one. All signs were pointing to an unhappy ending for this people who had been through so much. And, and into this moment, a moment that was heavy with anticipation, but also heavy with dread, stepped Hosea. Hosea came to show God's people a way out of the pit. And the way that Hosea would choose to do so is perhaps even after all these years, the most surprising thing about this book. Hosea wasn't going to come and stand on the edge of the pit and shout empty platitudes and easy answers, or even scathing criticism at his fellow Israelites from, from afar. He wasn't going to judge them from a position of safety and security. No, Hosea was going to get into the pit with them, and in a very real and very painful way, he was going to enter into their suffering himself so that he might help guide them as one who knew what they were going through. And so this brings us to the opening verses of Hosea, which, which remain one of the most shocking and at the same time one of the most heartbreaking passages in the Old Testament. Starting with verse 2 of chapter 1, it says, When the Lord began to speak through Hosea, the Lord said to him, Go marry a promiscuous woman and have children with her. For like an adulterous wife, this land is guilty of unfaithfulness to the Lord. So he married Gomer, daughter of Diblaim, and she conceived and bore him a son. Then the Lord said to Hosea, call him Jezreel, because I will soon punish the house of Jehu for the massacre at Jezreel, and I will put an end to the kingdom of Israel. And that day I will break Israel's bow in the valley of Jezreel. Gomer conceived again and gave birth to a daughter. Then the Lord said to Hosea, call her Lo Ruhama, which means not loved, for I will no longer show love to Israel that I should at all forgive them. Yet I will show love to Judah, and I will save them, not by bow, sword, or battle, or by horses and horsemen, but I, the Lord their God, will save them. After she had weaned Lo Ruhama, Gomer had another son. Then the Lord said, Call him Lo Ami, which means not my people, for you are not my people, and I am not your God. Now, when God chooses to speak through a prophet, when God chooses to make known his purposes through that prophet, this could mean a lot of things for what their lives might look like. But one thing it rarely, if ever, meant was that God was promising to grant this person an easy life or even a desirable life. The work of a prophet would, would take these, these servants of God into some difficult and very lonely places. Think about Elijah staring down 800 prophets of Baal with his life on the line. Think about Jeremiah stuck in the bottom of a well. But of all the trials and all the tribulations that prophets would often face in the line of duty, Hosea's had to be among the toughest at least in the terms of how it would tear him apart emotionally. Here at the outset of the book, God calls Hosea to take for himself a wife that he knows is going to be unfaithful to him. He calls him to, to have children with, to, to start a family with a woman who will inevitably betray him and break his heart. There's a reason why the Bible describes the relationship of marriage as being one flesh with another person, because to be bound in, in, in marriage to another person is among the most intimate, but therefore among the most vulnerable things that we will ever do. The capacity for joy is great, but so then is the capacity to be hurt. So when Hosea received this call from God, we have to imagine him wanting to plead with the Lord. Isn't there something else you want me to do? Couldn't I lead an army against the Assyrians? Maybe perform some miracles? But God's call for Hosea was in some ways much more difficult than either of those things. To enter into relationship with someone that he knew was going to hurt him. This calling was born out in the names that Hosea gives his children. His son's name, Jezreel, was resonant with the bloody scene of Jehu's massacre. It served not just as a reminder of that carnage, but also of, of punishment, of judgment to come. His daughter's name, <clears throat> Lo Ruhama, which translates to not loved spoke even more uh, to, the, to, the, uh, to the brokenness of God's people. It's hard to imagine how Hosea felt every time he spoke his daughter's name or that of his third child, Lo Ami, not my people. 
Every time he played with his children or cradled them or sang them to sleep at night, he would have been reminded of the distance that existed between God's children and their heavenly father. In the same way, every gesture of affection between him and his wife would have been tinged with a sadness that would have been almost impossible to overcome. Everything in him would have wanted to to show her a love that would bind them together. And so the grief that would come each time she turned her back on him would have been an overwhelming burden to bear. And we might ask, just as Hosea would have surely asked, what was the point in all of this? And the answer to that is bound up with his vocation as a prophet. The prophet is called to speak. The prophet is called to embody God's words to his people. The prophet is called to make known to God's children what they most need to hear, even when that's tough. And the message that Israel needed to hear most was that they had broken, in fact, they were breaking God's heart. Just as Hosea's wife had and would betray him with other men, they had forsaken the God who loved them by following after the false gods, the empty gods, the the idols and the ways of life that the nations around them had embraced. They had traded their priceless covenant calling for these other pursuits that could never live up to their promise. As God will say a little bit later in this book, he says, When Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. But the more they were called, the more they went away from me. They sacrificed to the Baals, and they burned incense to images. It was I who taught Ephraim to walk, taking them by the arms. But they did not realize it was I who healed them. I led them with cords of human kindness, with ties of love. To them, I was like one who lifts a little child to the cheek, and I bent down to feed them. And because God wanted to get his people's attention, and because there are few things more attention-grabbing than a tragic love story, God called Hosea to this difficult task of embodying his long-suffering love for his people. He called Hosea to endure the heartache and the scorn and the grief that comes with pledging himself to someone he loves only to find that commitment thrown back in his face. Yet, despite how Hosea must have felt when he married Gomer, despite the pangs he must have wrestled with when he named each of his children, this story is ultimately not a tragedy at all. In fact, very few of the prophetic stories are tragedies in the normal sense, where the curtain closes on a scene of gloom and doom. There are a few of those, and we'll talk about those at some point in the next couple of months, but Hosea isn't one of them. Because as I said, if Hosea's difficult calling was meant to convict, to shock, to shame the people of God into reckoning with the judgment of God, judgment that they undoubtedly deserved, the task of Hosea, like the task of so many prophets, also involved a powerful revelation of the hope that God extended to his people. A hope of salvation, a hope of redemption, a hope of a mercy that they had done nothing to deserve, but rather a mercy that came to them as a gift of God's overabundant love. After the painful account of Hosea naming his children, the last two verses of chapter 1 closes, close with the following. It says, Yet the Israelites will be like the sand on the seashore, which cannot be measured or counted. In the place where it was said to them, You are not my people. They will be called children of the living God. The people of Judah and the people of Israel will come together They will appoint one leader and will come up out of the land, for great will be the day of Jezreel. So if the story of Hosea's marriage to Gomer is rooted in a deep sense of sadness and loss, just as the narrative of Israel's up and down, two steps forward, three steps back relationship with their God often was filled with regret and lamentation, both of these stories, because they are stories written by a God of goodness and grace, are ultimately going to be stories of hope even stories of joy. To be sure, it will take a while to get there. Things are going to get worse for Hosea and Gomer before they get better. Hosea will have to pursue his wife with a relentless love. He will have to follow her down some dark and distant roads before he can bring her home. And as we hinted at earlier, for the people that Hosea is preaching to, a crushing defeat is just around the corner. They will be overcome by the Assyrians. They will ultimately be scattered to the far corners of the empire. But God's promises to them won't be defeated. God's plan for them won't be defeated. Most of all, God's love for them won't be defeated. The book of Hosea, for all the pain that we encounter in its pages, ends with God declaring the following. 
the closing verses of this book, he says, I will heal their waywardness and love them freely, for my anger has turned away from them. I will be like the dew to Israel. He will blossom like a lily. Like a cedar of Lebanon, he will send down his roots. His young shoots will grow. His splendor will be like an olive tree. His fragrance like a cedar of Lebanon. People will dwell again in his shade. They will flourish like the grain. They will blossom like the vine. Israel's fame will be like the wine of Lebanon. The book of Hosea is a difficult one. The book of Hosea speaks a word of judgment to uh, the, the, the people living in the 8th century BC who needed to hear it. But it also speaks a word to us that we need to hear. But for those of us who not only need to be healed of our waywardness, but who want to be healed of our waywardness, for those of us who long to return to the one who loves us, this book makes it clear that the God who loves us, like Hosea loved his wife, the God who loves his children through the generations, will renew us. He will restore us so that we might flourish like the grain, we might blossom like the vine, and we might rejoice in the long-suffering and life-giving mercy of our God. Please pray with me. God, we, we wrestle with the, a story like the one of Hosea because... In so many ways, it's our story. God, in so many ways, we see this story and we, we see ourselves not to be the, the righteous prophet who is obedient to your calling, but, but rather the, the wayward child or the wayward wife who, who wanders from where we're supposed to be. Lord, we are, we are Gomer. We are, we, are the, we are Israel in this story, Lord, as, as we, instead of pursuing the ways that you have set before us, we follow our own desires. And so God, we look at ourselves and maybe we say, lo ami, we are not your people. Maybe at times we look at ourselves and we say, lo ruhama, we feel that we are not loved. And yet God, the story of Hosea, the story of your word, the story of Jesus is, is, is a story that, that, that speaks to us that we are your people, that we are loved that there is nothing you won't do to, to find us wherever we might wander and to bring us home. And so, God, we give you thanks for this story, as hard as it is, as gut-wrenching as it is, as difficult as it is to confront our own sin, our own waywardness in this story. We thank you that we also see in this story your faithfulness, your steadfastness, your grace, and your, and your love. So, God, help us to embrace in our own lives uh, the, the ending to this story. Lord, an ending that speaks to our flourishing, that speaks to the abundant gifts that, that of, of your love and your mercy that you pour into the lives of those who seek you. God, help us to embrace those promises in our own life, that we might grow, that we might flourish, and that we might thrive in the life that you have set out for us. God, we, we, we thank you that you are a God who, no matter what we do, no matter who we are, you are a God who loves us. And we pray that we would seek that love. It's in the name of your son that we pray these things. Amen. We set aside time each week to respond to the good news of the gospel. And, and, and one of the things that we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna talk about as we make our way through the, the books of the Minor Prophets um, is that even, even in these books where maybe it's hard to discern the good news of the gospel, after all, these are Old Testament books. These are books that come from a very dark time in Israel's history. Um, throughout, just as in the book of Hosea, God is offering glimpses of his grace. God is offering, um, and, and, and sometimes he's whispering and sometimes he's shouting a message of his mercy and love. Um, and as the passage that, that Andrew read from earlier says, when Jesus entered the synagogue and he read the words of Isaiah about you know, God setting the prisoners free, about God bringing life and light to those he loves, Jesus said, today this word is fulfilled in your hearing. In Jesus the promises of God are fulfilled. In Jesus, the promises of God to bring us home, to, to pull us up out of the pit, to, to, to restore us to right relationship with him so that we might flourish and, 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 and uh, thrive in him. Those are fulfilled in Jesus. And God asks us to respond to that, just as throughout the centuries, both when Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, but in all the thousands, uh, the, 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 the centuries since, um, all the people who have responded to Jesus' wor Jesus's words, follow me, have encountered the fulfillment of God's promises in their response. 
And so that's the, that's the, the opportunity that's set before us anytime we encounter the good news, is to, to respond, to, to embrace what God is holding out for us. And so if you want to make that, that decision this morning, this is a time when you can do that. Confess the name of Christ. Uh, embrace the life he's holding out for you. Be baptized into him. And then you know, we, we, uh, we, we set out on the path that he's, he's laid out for us. There's also a time for those of you who know, as, as Ben reminded us this morning, um, we need other people to reach out for. We need other people to cling to. We need other people to lean on as we seek to grow um, because sometimes it, it, it can be lonely um, seeking to follow God if we're trying to do it on our own strength. Um, we can't do it on our own strength. And so we need others to, to help us. And if you want to join us here at First Christian as we seek to be those people for one another, you can do that as well. And then finally, this is just a time for those of you who need prayer. We would love to pray with you and, and pray for you. And if any of this is tough to do in front of a group of people, please talk to somebody before you leave. Um, let us pray with you. Let us pray for you. Let us see what God's doing in your life. But now as the worship team sings, let's stand and join them. If you have a decision to make, please come forward. Just as I am, I will receive, will welcome, pardon, cleanse, relieve, because thy promise. Once again, it has been a joy to get to worship with you all this morning, both those of you gathered here in the sanctuary and also those worshiping at home. Um, in a moment, we'll close with prayer, but before we do, just a, a couple of announcements. First of all, um, tomorrow, um, early afternoon, um, one of our members, uh, Gloria Guarini, who, who passed away this week, there will be a, um, a memorial service for her, uh, a graveside service for her um, at Evergreen Cemetery at 1 o'clock. Um, I know some of you, many of you know Gloria, some of you may not, but um, we, 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 we grieve with her family and, and we, we want to keep them in our prayers. Um, I think if you want to process with everyone or proceed with everyone over to Evergreen, there, there'll be meeting. Um, there's a visitation at Valley Funeral Home from 11 to 12.30, and then at 12.30 they're going to, uh, to leave from the funeral home to the, to the graveside at Evergreen. Um, and there will be a service there. So that's going to be tomorrow. Um, and then uh, on Wednesday, uh, we're, we're back into our sort of uh, regularly scheduled uh, Wednesday activities. So um, 
5.45, we'll gather for a meal in the fellowship hall for anyone who, who wants to have, have dinner before, um, before our times of study. So that's going to be at 5.45. And then at um, 6.45, we'll, we'll break into our groups, Action Theater for the kids. Uh, elementary age kids will be in the uh, fellowship hall. Um, the youth and adults will head over to this building um, and, and have youth group and Bible study, uh, conversation and, and, and discussion. Um, and so that's just a wonderful time in the middle of the week to pray with each other, to fellowship with each other, to, to, to grow together as we seek God's word and, and, and seek God in his word and seek God's purposes for us. And um, so if you've never joined us for that, this is a great time to do that. We're, we're kind of at the start of, of, of a new semester, the start of a new time together, a new season. Um, and so join us on Wednesday night, starting at 545 with the meal and then at 645 with our, um, our times of study. I think on the menu is tacos and quesadillas this week. So um, there may be a, sh a, a slip, a sheet in the bulletin is there to let us know you're coming. Um, but um, if, if you don't normally come to the meal and you think you want to, maybe call the church office and that'll give us some sense of, of how many people to prepare for. But come even if you don't and, and we'll have plenty of food for everybody. So tacos and quesadillas on, on Wednesday at 545. 645 is our times of, of action theater, youth group, and... Uh, adult conversation, Wednesday night conversation. Um, any other announcements? All right, well, let's close in prayer. God, we thank you for this morning you've given us, and we thank you for uh, the, the joy that comes with gathering together. And most of all, Lord, we thank you for the hope we have in you, the hope uh, that we, we find in your grace. Um, it's a hope we don't deserve. It's a hope that um, lifts us out of our pit and a hope that points us uh, in, in ways that we might walk, in ways that we might seek you, in ways that we might serve you. And so, God, we, that's our prayer for today as we leave this place, that we would go out as those who have been redeemed, um, as those who have been restored and renewed, that we might share that with others. Uh, help us to be uh, messengers and ministers of your kingdom. It's in your son's name we pray all of these things. Amen. Go in peace.